If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode titled The Worst Way to Lose Weight. Oh, God, no. We open up uh, by talking about uh, stuff that has nothing to do with losing weight. Don't be uh, ashamed if it's you. Yeah. We talk about uh, how cars got their names. Uh, Justin got a new truck. Yeah. Why I still drive a Jetta and why that's actually driving some of my insecurity. Mm. And uh, some <laughs> Good of the play on words. Some sir. of the first cars that we've owned. Now, we, that's about 11 minutes. And then we get into. The actual topic. The meat. Where we talk about the worst ways to lose weight. I actually talk about a study that demonstrates that uh, super active people, like hunter-gatherer societies, who are extremely active, don't burn really any more calories than sedentary individuals. It's crazy oh, uh, science, uh, but it's backed by studies. And uh, I talk about that. We talk about why certain forms of exercise are, in terms of weight loss, are maybe a waste of your time why you should focus on other things. Running that cake off might not be a good idea. I go into depth uh, off a, on a tangent about glyphosates. These are the things that they blast all over your GMO foods and all over foods that contain wheat and what that means for your health and for your weight loss goals. So and we at, talk the, at the very end, you get a little Easter egg for those of you that are trying to get in shape and get fit for summer. That's too. it. So wait till the end and you hear Adam drop that. So without any further ado, here we are talking about the worst way to lose weight. Why did they name that car DeLorean? The guy's name was DeLorean. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks see, the obvious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Typically yeah. why they name cars after. Yeah. You've been served, <laughs> like sir. Here's your car. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's like the D. Tommaso. What's his name? D. D. Tommaso. What was that one song? Uh, what song? That one car that uh, was like Ford engine, but it was a tie-in car. Oh, Pantera. Mm-hmm. Pantera? Yeah. Pantera. M most are, right? I mean, I yeah. think most vehicles are named after the inventor or creator, right? I mean, No, I, I think the Camaro was named after a horse. Mustang is a horse. Mustang is a horse. I know, most uh, Fiesta, Mustang. Ford Fiesta, that's a party. It's a party. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> that's... <laughs> the, the Nova uh, the, didn't do too well in Mexico. Yeah, you're, yeah. Talking about, you're talking about the actual car, though. DeLorean's a DeLorean, just like a Ford is a Ford. Those are, those are, those are models oh, of... That's a saying. model of... That's like the that's a Ford Model T. That's like the Model T. Oh, yeah, yeah, That's yeah, different. Yeah. It like, could be, right? The Tesla wasn't named after the maker. It was named after a scientist. Nikola Tesla. Well, that, it doesn't. Yeah, uh, my we, point we is, that it's, it's normally named after a, a man related to the fucking science that's fucking behind yeah. the fucking car being built. I'm trying <laughs> to think electricity. <laughs> You're think trying Tesla to, or Edison. Yeah. Like, which one are you going to pick? I'm you trying know? to think of a car. The that Edison. Was, that just doesn't yeah. sound as cool. I'm trying to think of a car that wasn't. Yeah. Dang, you may be right. Yeah. We should make a car then. Well, like what? I what don't kind know. of car? Like we'll call it the Justin. <laughs> yeah. The Justin it's Mobile. It's got a big old rear end. It's got a huge back bumper. Yeah, it's like a boat. It's re <laughs> it's rear wheel, rear wheel yeah, drive. Big ass steering wheel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or the sh or the shaker. Hey, when does your new truck come in? You got to um, come in soon, right? Yeah, hopefully the end of this week. The yeah. end of the oh, really? Yeah. Oh, are you? Excited? What kind of truck did I'm you excited. get? A GMC. Just Denali. a just a big old testosterone car. Yeah, it's the Denali though. Right? Is it a hybrid, Justin? Are you being yeah. nice to the environment? No, man. I'm gonna carbon the shit out of everybody. Did you <laughs> What people don't know is it was running on unleaded gasoline, but Justin switched it out for coal because it's yeah. so much cheaper. <laughs> it so is he's got, cheaper. He's got one of, the few, one of the few coal-powered- Coal-burning <laughs> vehicles. Big, yes. Yeah, it looks like- Shove the, stuff in there to looks, burn. Looks like the Industrial Revolution 1910 yeah. <laughs> driving by. You'll notice me with this huge like black you know, plume of clouds. Yeah. yeah. He's giving people- you know, charcoal lung, or yeah. what do they call that? I'm excited about having Black a truck lung. again, though, because it's just like, <gasps> oh, I can just put shit in there and do some dump I runs. I miss my truck, man. Dude, I love trucks. You get a badass truck. Dude. I, I love trucks, one. but you're going to be called now all the time to help people move. <laughs> Good luck. Yes. My phone doesn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. That yeah. is that is the problem. It is. Used, you're right. You're right. So my... so. I've owned a few different. You know, I'm not a car guy. Right? I'm not a big. I mean, I can find cars pretty cool, but I'm not. It's not a yeah, big deal Prius, for me. Yeah, the Prius is cool, right? It's just not a big deal. Yeah. Um, and but there is one car that I own that I really, really fucking loved. Always, always loved this car. What is it, Jetta? No, no, it's not my Jetta. <laughs> oh. Why do you always make fun of my Jetta? I'm, I'm not making fun. Do you, you know? Love it. Do you know that? Now I'm finding myself a little bit insecure about my fucking Jetta because you assholes. Why, why, dude? Come on. It's totally uh, challenging my, my ego. Really? Yeah, I've, I I've ridden shotgun many times. I just don't care, but fine. now I'm starting to care because I'm like, why are they making fun of me so much? Do mm -hmm. I look that dumb? 
Whoa. And when Ben came to visit, because Greenfield was here, I was like, oh, shit, I'm going to have to drive him around in my Jetta hmm. that Adam makes fun of all the time. He's probably stoked on it. He's going to huh? think I'm a loser. And, uh, and then I had to, like, you know, check myself. Anyway, my favorite car that I ever owned was my Toyota pickup truck. See, you like trucks, too. Stick shift, four-cylinder. <laughs> the little oh, wow. pickup. That, that's got a lot of torque. No, it's... Uh, four-cylinder. You know why I liked it so much? Why is that? I didn't have to worry about shit. Yeah. Like, you just... You don't even have to... Do you just anything. get up and go. You barely have to put gas in it. Yeah. And it'll last oh, you forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was my favorite car. Well, you know I what? I mean, they did build them to last, like the Toyota. Dude, my dad had one that had like 300 something thousand miles on it. I know. And he never did anything to it. I have a funny car story, actually. Like soon. A funny car story? Or yeah, a funny well, it's just a funny story. situation. Oh, okay. okay. So I was I was dating Courtney at the time. Uh, like we weren't even really dating. I was still trying really hard to date her. And I took her on a date. And she didn't. <laughs> you were you trying know. to date her? Dude, she put me through the ringer. Anyway. So I was like picking up my car at the 24 hour fitness where I left it. And at the time I had like this like Tercel, like a Toyota <laughs> Tercel piece of shit. Okay. Right. And like, you know, thank God I have confidence. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, any other dude would have been like, Oh God, like, yeah. can't like I took her out in the Tercel. Right. <laughs> and then uh, I drop her off. She's, she had this like SS Camaro, you know, oh, no her head is just fucking badass, you know? And so she gets in her car, I say goodbye, whatever. And then we meet up again at the stoplight and I'm looking over at her and I'm looking back and I'm just, and so rev like, your engine. I rev rev my like, engine. I was like, <laughs> wee, wee, you. And then like thought it was like going to be funny. You know, she looked over at me and she put her hand like over her face. No, she, <laughs> she drove off and like peeled out. And I was like, Oh no. Oh no. This car sucks. I drove, I drove a, in high school, the first car I drove was a shit Brown 1987 Toyota Camry. Oh, I thought you were going to say and, Honda Civic. And, and I was going to be like, yeah, I had one of those. And a Toyota Camry is not a bad car, but it, this was the year that they they thought that turd brown would be a cool color for people for some weird reason, and yeah, yeah. it was old. Yeah, and here it had, you go. Here's a moving piece of shit. Well, and it was it was already like ten years old, so the the sun had had oxidized the paint, so it was like this. It was all <laughs> it's got all, spots. Oh yeah, it was all there. fucked up. Every, the headliner kind of come down. Oh, every dude, every tire every up. tire and wheel was different. You're right, so I and I was missing hubcaps on three of the four wheels. The rear tail light was busted out. My parents had accidentally left the windows down on a really stormy winter night, and it got flooded inside there, so it smelled like mildew oh, no. inside of the inside of the car. And then they locked their keys in the trunk one time, so my dad had to drill the. The, the 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 key lock out of the trunk so there was no like key. the thing was just a piece of shit. how'd then, you keep it on after that like then, bungee cords oh yes totally oh no oh, it was so ghetto so I drove that for a good year and a half in high school for me but you know what back to get back to the old like built character man I think oh, yeah. you, oh, I think dude. everybody should have bro to, I still got dates in that piece of shit right that's I'm what not what done building character <laughs> I see <that. laughs> you got some work well it's not a piece of shit it's no that's I, I you don't have but I had so I had a what did I drive a Colt a nineteen, God it must have been like an eighty five eighty four, Colt you guys remember Colts the Dodge the Dodge Colt, Colt. and it was uh, when I, I turned like. and I don't maybe you guys can tell me because you get well you're not really uh, Justin's kind of a car guy when I would turn the car a little sharp it would go click 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 as I'm turning mm. so what was that. So like it didn't it, it didn't track at all. I don't know. It would make this fucking sound. It's so every, yeah. so if I had <laughs> this is quiz Justin your steering it. column. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. Like you'd hear it like like cuck, 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 it would make this sound. So anyway, that's when, you normally have a baseball card in your spokes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I would have said. Yeah. So I had whenever I'd have people in my car, I'd try to avoid making U turns because it would make that sound. <laughs> like I could take a wide turn, but uh, if I turn too much, did it have power steering? Uh, no. Oh yeah. No, it didn't have power steering. The the AC didn't work, so it, it got the nickname the Inferno because it would get hot <laughs> as fuck. Uh, and you'd ride in that thing in the summer and it was like a sauna. You yeah. just sweat your dick off in there. And we took it to Did it have bees like in the engine or anything? Or no. Rat's nest? What? No, no, it didn't have any of that. Okay. So you guys remember when you first got your driver's license, how like you just want to drive places like you well, didn't care like let's I, go to the mall that's cool yeah so me and my cousins one day were like let's go to santa cruz okay so we're driving over the hill and the top speed that i could hit like floored because my car was full of people 
was 40 miles an hour. So I'm going 40. Nice. Yeah, and then we overheated. Semi's passing you. We overheated when we were in Santa Cruz. Ooh. Yeah. The, you know, this is why I, I think it's crazy when parents buy their kids like really nice cars in high school or their first car because- It's stupid. It is silly because at that age, first of all, you're more likely to get in an accident than, than you are when you're 30 plus or whatever, yeah. mid 20s even, right? If you're just your first vehicle, the, the likelihood of you getting in an accident is much, much higher. The other thing is at that age, you just- you don't give a fuck. You just care about yeah, transportation. You just want to get out and go. Like I was so grateful for that piece of shit car because it was like, yeah. you know, because the previous fifteen years of my life I was on foot, you yeah. know, or on a bi- <laughs> on a bicycle or rollerblades. This yeah. was a fucking upgrade and hey, a half. Girl, you, you know, walking so, home? <laughs> I got yeah. a car. Right. Yeah. So it was such it's a, a fucking turd, but it's a car. Right. And yeah. it builds character. So I think I think it's a, there's there's lessons to learn from that. I think it's important. That's that, one of the reasons why I don't feed my kids sometimes because so I want them to when they eat. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Appreciate the when, you're a yeah, dictator. Like I'm so yeah. hungry, Dad. I can barely. All right, you can eat. Here's something. your rations. Yeah, and I give them a little bit of food, and they're like, "Oh my, thank you, God, for this." You know, and they're yeah. so happy wow. for the food That's that I finally gave them after five Just days. Good strategy. Totally joking, I by like the way. That. I don't want child protective yeah, services. Yeah. Did I tell you guys about the time I made a stupid joke at my kid's school? Next to the teacher, and the teacher looked at me like she was going to call the fucking authorities on me. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, we were. it was like an open house. Yeah, See, they don't get it. I have know? the worst. My, my sense of humor is super inappropriate in the worst places. We're at the school, and we're looking at like the stuff that the kids did, you know, because it's an open house. And she's like, oh, and your, your son did this and that. And, and she's like, and he did this, but he forgot this part here, so you might want to talk to him about it. And I'm like, I'm just gonna have to beat him again. And <laughs> you did not yeah, say I did. that to the and teacher. And she looked at me like, like this look, like, are you serious? Oh, I got Am love I gonna it. call the? And I'm like, oh, I don't beat my You're kid. Like, okay? Come on, lady. Yeah. I'll beat your kid, but not oh, my kid, because oh, I love my kid. I don't know your kid. <laughs> hey, you, uh, yeah. you just, you just came across the study you were talking about. I want you, to, I wanted you to bring it up while we're on air. Uh, in regards to the topic that we talked about the other day, dude. On, so on the podcast. yeah, so I actually brought this up on an episode. It was I think it was a Q and A a little while back where we were talking about um, one thing led to another, and we we're talking about the obesity epidemic and what the cause is mm-hmm. for the obesity epidemic. And um, you had brought up how technology, in, uh, yeah, how, yeah, that's it, and how inactive we are, right? How we just don't move anymore. And this has been part of the paradigm surrounding the obesity epidemic now for a while in which they say hey one of the main reasons why we have obesity and one of the main reasons if not the main reason why children are getting obese is because we don't move nearly as much as we used to and on paper this makes total sense if you if you try to calculate calorie burn from tons of activity versus calorie burn from no activity then you're going to come out with big differences, right? And they said in the past, like, a woman 100 years ago burned, like, 3,000 calories a day or something like that, and a woman today burns, like, 1,700 calories a day. So there, there you go. That's why we're obese. And it makes sense, right? Face value, it makes total sense. But uh, the science actually is showing that that is not the, co- the, not the case at all. And it's really proving, and I brought up this particular study that I just actually looked up again and I saw some more on this. But before I get into them, um, because these studies are proving that that's not the case at all. And it, it it's cool because it's important. Well, when you, when you say it, I, I don't know if you can say at all. I think that's a strong statement. Oh, well, so check this out. So yeah, you're, you're going to have to, you're going to have so to there's, wow me there's with been, this study to get me. So to there's been several this. studies, but there was one that was published, I believe in 2012, um, let me see if I can find the name of it. Um, the scientist's name was Kravitz, and he was stu- Kravitz? Uh, no Alexei Kravitz. I'm gonna go my way <laughs> already. <laughs> he, uh, he's a it's a great song. Uh, no, well that's let me see. Let me make sure I get the right one because there was one study in particular that was really uh, just really blew me away. Sorry, um, that was actually the wrong study. That's another study we're going to talk about. But uh, Ponser. Ponser, P-O-N-T-Z-R, uh, did a study on some tribes in Africa, and they were using these methods of testing their metabolic rate that are pretty accurate, hmm. where you can you can uh, figure out how much how many calories someone's burning throughout the day, and this was a tribe of typical hunter gatherers, so their days consisted of lots of activity, far more activity than the average person, 
And he thought that he'd find this huge calorie burn. Like, okay, these people. How are they doing? Did they say was it like uh, like heart rate um, monitoring or like what was the <clears throat> measured device that they're using? No, um, let me see if they have here uh, how they were studying it. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep looking well, it up. Well, you can see. Keep, uh, is that the study right there? Done? I don't know. Oh, um, you're, just, you're just putting random shit up there. Yeah. So anyway, he thought for sure he would see a ton of calories being burned um and it was weird because it didn't make sense because they were eating so little on top of it most hunter gatherers don't eat a lot mainly because food is not easy to get uh it's when you're a hunter gatherer it just it just isn't so when they're looking at this these people's metabolic rates he found that they burned right around the same amount of calories as uh an office worker um and he it just blew him away. He couldn't figure out why. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, um, and some of the theories surrounding it are saying things like the body becomes very efficient at activity. Which we know this. And the body adapts its basal metabolic rate at rest. So he found that they burn right around the same amount of calories as somebody who's inactive. Now, this makes, now in hindsight, at first you're like, this is crazy. That they should be burning more calories. But if you really think about it, it makes perfect sense. It makes no sense that the human body would evolve to just burn shit tons of calories with lots of activity in environments where food was scarce, which is how the human body evolved. The human body evolved where food was very scarce. We mm-hmm. fasted a lot of the time. We went without food a lot of the time. Well, we're the most efficient at storing uh, energy and storing calories. Like that, We're trying to survive. Like We're... What we're talking about, that goes against, like, survival mechanisms. Mm-hmm. It, it, it makes perfect we, sense, right? We're not the best at storing energy, though. Uh, of mm-hmm. all animals? Yeah, no. No, we're just, I mean, but we are like good an, at Like it. an alligator eats, like, once a year. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Like, we're really good at it. I learned this in the nature yeah. channel. Wow, that's, yeah. man. Little random. You're looking at the spider webs yeah. and all that? Little wow. random, little random fact you, for you guys man. right there. I like the little Nat Geo <laughs> I love it. knowledge I coming in Is it in once here. a year? That yeah, once a year. Wow, that's crazy. That's cool. So, um. I was fascinated by that. So, it. It makes sense because we evolved in these environments with very, very little food. And when we did find it, many times we found not much. And to get the food, we had to do a lot of moving. Um, And so, of course, the humans that had metabolisms that were super adaptive, where they could slow way down to compensate for this, were the survivors. And they were the ones that were going to procreate. And those are the genes that we inherited. And so... And this is, look, as personal trainers, this makes perfect sense. You guys know as well as I do. How futile is it for a client to come in who wants to lose 40 pounds and do, and change nothing about their diet and just beat themselves up in the gym? How yeah. effective is that? Yeah, it's yeah, not it's at all. A Never. Horrible strategy. It just doesn't work. In fact, what do we always see when, when people do that? They'll initially lose some weight, and mm. then they will lose nothing and sometimes gain weight again. And then they're working out like crazy just to stay where they're and at. And then they burn out. Yeah, and then they keep those bad eating habits, and it's just... It doesn't change anything. Nothing. The other thing, too, uh, that was interesting is the obesity epidemic really took off in the like 70s, 80s. That's when it started to explode, and then it's just kind of accelerated from there, right? We were kind of sedentary before that, like... You know, the Industrial Revolution kind of modernized things. We had the Agricultural Revolution for a long time. Like, humans weren't super active in the 50s and 60s either. I mean, a little more than they are now, but it wasn't like this dramatic change in activity level. What changed was the food. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that being said, I think that's important to communicate to people and that scientists are actually um, discovering this through their own, uh, through their own study. I mean, fucking mind blowing, right? No, it is, but I think it's a strong statement to say that it's all because of the food. I think there, there still is a, there's still something to be said about the lack of movement and strength training and that and and what that role plays in your overall metabolism. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, the common because it, it makes it, it makes perfect sense, right? If you're if you are only eating so much and you're having to go out and hunt your food and you only get 1,800, 2,000 calories, eventually the body will. It'll adapt. Just like that's why we tell people not to mm-hmm. diet that way, right? We tell people, like, don't go from over consuming like crazy 4,000 calories a day to a 1,500 calorie diet and exercising like crazy because guess what? Mm-hmm. The body will adapt and get efficient on that. 
you know, if you go from four to th- four thousand down to that, like you might see great change for the first couple of weeks, but this your body real quick will get adapted. We were just talking about this yesterday. I was with Miles hanging out, and he was, you know, asking about how I was training and how I start to increase my volume over time. And I was like, you know, the mistake that a lot of people make is they go from this, hey, I'm out of shape, I need to get in better shape, or I've got this wedding in six weeks, or whatever the fuck may be that they're motivated all of a sudden. And they go from not paying attention to what they're consuming, eating all kinds of bad choices, drinking alcohol, not really exercising, strength training, to boom, strict diet. They're eating chicken salads every day. They're ex- they're doing cardio for an hour. They're training their ass off. Water. Yeah, yeah, they're training their ass off in the gym. And it's like, why would I want to do that? First of all, like it would be miserable to go from one extreme to the other extreme. Like the workouts are going to be awful. It'd be like reminding me of Hell Week when I was in high school. I mean, you're not your your body is only going to figure that out, and then you're going to have to find a new level that you're going to have to reach if you want to continue to see change in your physique. Well, so I, I think it's important. We need to say this that although uh, trying to burn more calories through activity is probably and 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 using that as your weight loss strategy is a horrible weight loss strategy. Um, it, that doesn't mean that exercise uh, is a waste. Um, it's very good for you, period, end of story. Now, because you improve your health through exercise, inadvertently you may improve your body's ability through more balanced hormones, through you know, uh, you know, better mood, no, through a, a better strong, strength. Yeah, a stronger heart, more All, muscle. There's so much more going on. Those things will contribute to a body that's more likely to not want to store tons of body fat. So there's definitely effects that will help you lose weight from exercise. Many of them, if not most of them, come from just being healthier. But there's, there's, there's some other studies that are pretty interesting. There was a study, there was another study that was done. Um, it was published in Obesity Research in 1994, and it was a great study because they actually took. That's an old study. Bro. They, well, they took. You know, I'll tell you why I'm quoting the study. They took pairs of twins, and some of the best studies you could find are ones that study twins because you can have one do one thing and one do another thing, and like like you, they're, they're identical, right? Yeah, they're identical, yeah. and you can control certain things. Anyway, what they found was that, and they and they also housed them uh, in a research laboratory with 24 hour supervision, so it was like super control, right? And they would have these uh, one of these twins do um, like cardio every single day, and I forgot how much they did. It was uh, I think like two hours of stationary biking or something like that every single day. The calorie expenditure that the that the researchers thought that they were going to see was off by something like twenty or thirty percent. So they were like, "Oh, you're hmm. going to burn this many more calories." Well, it turned out to be way less than they thought, and they only lost something like ten pounds when they calculated that they should have lost way more based on the food that they were eating, and remember, they were supervised this entire time, mm-hmm. and uh, by the calories that they were burning, and they're again, they were supervising their entire time. So, and and they were like, "This is crazy. It doesn't make mathematical sense." You know, the whole like thirty five hundred calories equals one pound of fat, and you do yeah. the math. Yeah, it didn't make fucking sense. And the reason that they they that they theorize is their bodies adapted super well to burning less calories with activity, which is what they found. Not only not only that, but they found that the the twins that did all the activity burned less calories at rest mm-hmm. than their sedentary uh, uh, twin. So it's like the body totally adapted to slow down. Uh, yeah, you just see that with you know anybody that's been doing a lot of endurance and like how their heart rate. It's impossible for them to get their heart rate to like get get to a max level because they're so adapted and it's they're efficient. You become super efficient at, at utilizing your energy. Mm-hmm. Well, there's well, well, this is here's some other stuff. Just you know, before you before you uh, add some other interesting stuff, studies have demonstrated that when people exercise, inadvertently without realizing it, uh, they increase their food intake. Now there could be a psychological effect. I deserve this because I'm exercising. Um, although other studies have demonstrated that it may not be that. It's actually the body kicking up its hunger mechanisms to make up for the extra calories uh, being burned. They also find that when people exercise, they tend to be more sedentary throughout the day, just naturally. Mm. Again, the Mm. body may be sending signals saying, you burned a lot of calories earlier, we need to conserve. Ooh, all that's these a things. great point because you see people that hammer themselves in the gym for like an hour 
And then they're pretty much like on the couch and like trying to recuperate after that, like one workout, like so ineffective mm-hmm. in comparison to just moving constantly and having like light resistance work. I remember reading a study about eight, 10 years ago that talked about, um, you know, the average person as far as if, you know, if you worked out an hour intensely a day, every single day that you're still considered sedentary. Mm-hmm. Because even if you blast the gym for an hour, the amount of movement and calorie expenditure that you accomplish just in one hour, you're only talking like six, eight hundred calories mm-hmm. tops. I mean, that's high intensity too. Like most people are just doing a cruising through. And a now you're prioritizing like healing, and don't, know, which is like it's not advancing you. No, and don't forget, like if you're burning eight hundred calories or six hundred calories with your new workout, and you're doing it all the time. Studies will show that you're not going to burn 600 calories after doing that for a month or whatever. Eventually, your body becomes so efficient. Dude, only a cu- okay. So cardio, it only takes the body about two to three weeks to adapt to to your cardiovascular training. It takes four to six weeks on average to adapt to whatever resistance training that you're doing. So it's if and I used to do this like watching my VO2. You can increase your VO2 max like every day. Like if you decide, okay, I like for someone like me, I don't do any cardio. That's why right? I never bought into those uh, those meters, you know, oh, VO two. Yeah, it's like it's like whatever. It doesn't it changes even, all the time. Yeah, you can change it so easy and so fast. Like we, if we were to measure VO two right now, get out there. I run as hard as I can for 20 minutes. We see where my heart rate's at. We see where my cardio threshold is at. Tomorrow, I can increase that and improve that already. Mm-hmm. So it just shows you how fast your body adapts, your cardiovascular system adapts to those types of stresses. So this is what I would just boggled me in the bodybuilding world was when I would see all these bodybuilders off season doing cardio still. And I'm going like, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you telling your body that this is like normal for it? And then when you go into cutting for your show, you try and add a more a little bit more cardio or you ramp it up a little bit and it's already pretty efficient at what you've been doing so you don't get much of a response from it and when you're in the business of your body changing aesthetically you want to be able to do something and then your body respond to it especially if you're putting in extra work so it makes no sense for these bodybuilders and these coaches that are prescribing fucking cardio to their their bodybuilders their bikini athletes mm-hmm off season it doesn't make sense not if you want to be efficient come prep time and this is also why i'd always tell these guys that you know most the hard work for those that inspire to be a a competitor is pre pre contest prep Mm -hmm. is how you set your metabolism up how you get everything ready to go so that when you do start to throw things at it heading into prep your body every week is giving you change well you, you you have to understand this one simple fact and that is that the human body is extremely complex. It's extremely complex in its abilities to uh, adapt to different stimulus and to its environment. It's a survival machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you know, it's a survival machine that's evolved over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And it, you come from a long line of humans that survived certain conditions. And so your body's very, very, very adaptable. There's studies that show that there's an actual upper limit to metabolism. In other words, they'll take people and have them burn shit tons of calories and then they'll have them burn more calories and they'll have them burn more calories and it's like they hit a limit. Mm -hmm. Like their body stops burning more calories by compensating its other mechanisms. Which Mm -hmm. makes total sense why we see professional athletes, marathon runners not disappear. Because if if yeah. if, the, if, the, if it was simply mathematics and it was calories in versus calories out and the body just kept on bur- the more you burn the more you burn body yeah. fat then the, they would literally wither away. Like, wow, you're a I mean, your 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 professional athletes, the amount of football or soccer, or whatever the fuck their sport is they're playing is so much that any any other person like that would you would think right. yeah they would just it, it doesn't work that way. So for you for your body to even consider that it wants to burn more calories, okay? you ha- It has to have a good reason. Now, one of the reasons it burns more calories is simple movement. Like, it needs to use this gas, you know, this energy, just to move. But that's very, very quickly something that your body adapts to. The other way that your body realizes it needs to, uh, or, or thinks it needs to burn more calories, is to support active tissues. Uh, muscle is one of the most expensive, if you will, 
Uh, the brain is probably, by the way, one of the most expensive organs in the body. But your muscles are expensive in the in the in the in the sense that they cost a lot of energy to move and to maintain. So it's an expensive tissue in comparison to like fat. Fat's a little cheaper. Fat's easy to store. Muscle, not so much. So why would your body want to carry expensive tissue if you're and consider your body? wants to conserve energy always. That's its number one. It's one of its top goals. One of its top goals is to be as efficient as possible because remember, it doesn't know we live in a land of, of plenty. It doesn't know that we're modern you know, humans in the year 2017. It's, it thinks it's, you know, again, a hunter-gatherer where barely any food is around and you're always moving. So why would your body even bother adding this expensive tissue that's just going to cost more energy to support? And so ask yourself that. What's the reason? Well, the reason is because it thinks it's in its best interest. So how do we send that signal? How do we tell the body, hey, I know you're, you're designed and evolved mm. to be as efficient as possible, but uh, I'm going to want you to add this expensive tissue. And the, reason, the way I'm going to tell you uh, or show you this is I'm going to send a signal that tells you that it's in your best interest. And that's in a nutshell what proper resistance training right. is and it has to happen with frequency you have to like constantly you gotta send that signal that. yeah all the time otherwise the, the minute that you know you stop like the you know week two weeks three weeks you know it's your body's like it starts registering Dude, that information this that is data. this is why you lose muscle so fast yeah. your body doesn't burn it by the way your body's just adapting and trying to become more efficient. And I, and if you don't believe me, if you're a muscular guy or girl, here's what you do. Put your arm in a brace for one week. That's it. Just yeah. do it for one week. Don't move it for a week. And take that brace off. And visibly, yeah. you will have lost a considerable amount of muscle and strength within one week. Oh, yeah. No, well, they say it's three. So studies have shown it's about three days, approximately three days after the uh, the, the muscle has fully recovered from any sort of you know strength training or stimulus for atrophy to start to set in. So three days. So within, if you did bicep curls on Sunday, by next Sunday again, it, the atrophy is already starting to happen if it's it has not been stimulated again between the, now and then. Right? That's right. So, it doesn't. It, it's a. Cra it's crazy how much work it takes for us to yeah. maintain the the lean body mass. And well, th that's, why that's why it doesn't it doesn't stop with a goal. Well, uh, well that's you why know, if you're that's... if you're gonna work out to be lean, especially in the long term, the really the the by far the most important form of exercise is the one that tells your body to be less efficient with its calories, and that's with resistance training. There's there's no other form of exercise that comes close because all other forms of exercise rely on the calorie burn of the activity itself. Whereas resistance, look, here's the bottom line. If I lift weights for an hour, I'm going to burn less calories than if I do a 20-minute run. Mm -hmm. Like 60 minutes of weight training isn't going to burn as many calories as a 20-minute hard run. But I can tell you this much right now, if I lift weights for 60 minutes consistently and I do this you know, every other day and I do trigger sessions and all stuff versus a twin of mine who's doing hardcore cardio all the time, yeah. I'm going to be who's leaner. Gonna, yeah, who's going to build more muscle? I'm because I'm going to have more muscle on me. Yeah. I'm going to have more expensive. I'm going to be less, you know, calorie efficient, yeah. if you will. Because well, my body think we've I have talked muscle. about this too in the show, and, and you know, the, and these are more numbers that are debatable and exactly and how precise they are, and everybody is uniquely different. Because I remember, like a year and a half ago, when I dropped this, everybody was like, "Well, I've heard it's this," and oh, it's like it's that's not the point. The point is that for every pound of muscle you have on your body, your body utilizes somewhere between thirty to sixty more calories a day. So if you're somebody who adds, you know, five pounds of muscle, like you, let's say you do not change your diet whatsoever, you eat exactly the same, but you, you start to strength train, you at your scale goes up five pounds, you put on five pounds of lean muscle on your body, your body now is burning 300 or so calories more per day, every day without doing any extra activity, just because you have that lean muscle tissue on you. So the, the number's debatable. I mean, everybody's yeah, uniquely different. and that different. can vary, right? Yes. But the bottom line is uh, more muscle equals more uh, higher calorie expense. Yeah, faster metabolism. Yeah, and so if, you know, you take you now versus you, you know, with an extra five pounds of muscle, you're going to burn more calories. You've just got more of this expensive uh, tissue. But, you know, the whole exercise, like, you know, the reason why we're obese is we're just, we're not moving. It feeds right into the whole 
uh, it's, it's kind of punishing it's, yourself. Like yeah, penance. yeah. It's yeah. your own fault because you're yeah. lazy and you've got poor self control. The 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 truth is right now what's coming out is it's not nearly that black and white. It is not nearly as black and white as you're not moving enough and you're eating too much. It's more like you're not uh, moving the right way and you're not eating the right foods. That's that's becoming yeah. the actual, uh, that's what the science is actually saying because simply reducing calories and moving more, the body adapts pretty rapidly. And again, this obesity epidemic exploded not because all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you know, Overnight, Americans stopped moving and just started eating no, way more calories. No, I mean, calories. that same message has been pounded into the entire public, and it hasn't really put a dent in our problem at all. So no. we have to reevaluate, like you said, the quality of the movement, the quality of the food you're consuming, and really dive into that and see you know, where the, the problems lie. I think if the message was, because the message still is, you know, 30 minutes of vigorous activity every single day, and they're very, very... Um, vague with it, right? Mm-hmm. And it, this will help you lose weight. And it's okay, it'll improve your health because you're moving for sure, by the way. Very good for you to move versus not move. But I, the message needs to be everybody should do resistance training. Only because uh, just modern modern society, like, fuck, man, the, the food that we eat is just, even the good, even if we eat healthy, we tend to eat more than we need to. So Im- imagine I'm, you know, I'm Susie. I'm 30 pounds overweight. I'm you're you know, hot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I'm uh I'm 30 pounds overweight. Well, yeah. that's okay. I know you're yeah, like a little thicker. thicker. <laughs> you got so, it all in the right places. And <laughs> I I haven't been following any sort of consistent resistance training program. I don't track or pay attention to my consumption. I think I eat clean foods, which we all know what that looks like for yeah. people. By the mm. way, uh, I can't remember what's I eat lean cuisines yeah. every day. I eat healthy. Yeah. It's like the first opener I of eat the, the conversation. The 50% yeah. I eat healthy, fit. but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I eat the half hammered. fat uh, yeah. hot pockets. Oh, do you? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'm listening. Most people's understanding of, you know, eating healthy or clean or well or whatever is, is, is grossly off. But, you know, so let's say Susie is overweight, hasn't uh, really followed a training regimen whatsoever, is not tracking her food, so doesn't really understand what she's consuming yet. And she is motivated because summer's around the corner and she wants to get it in the best shape of her life or as best shape as she can come bikini time because she's got a Vegas trip. What are some of the things that you're saying to her you know, right to to start her on this journey, and what are the thing? What are the things you're cautioning her about? What are the things you're going to tell her to do? What's your advice to that client? So, and I've had clients like this. Um, I've had a lot of clients like this, and my approach has always been educate. My approach has always been mm-hmm. let's sit down and let's talk about your goals. Now let's talk about uh, the way we're going to get your to your goals and why. And I'm going to talk to her about. What we're talking about now, why manually trying to burn calories is going to be a massive waste of time for her. Yeah, you're um, just going to spin your wheels. Well, yeah, yeah I'm, we're going to spin your wheels. You're going to spend a lot of energy doing it. Uh, you're not going to feel good. You're going to you're going to end up worse than you are now. Um, I'm going to talk about the quality of food. I'm going to talk about things like how your gut health contributes to things like appetite and how you burn calories. Um, and we're going to, and, and I'm going to ask her, look, um, you know, I'd ask people this question all the time. Are you looking for real results that stay with you or do you want to bounce back and forth, uh, like you've been doing? And I've never, almost never had anybody tell me that they want to do the old, you know, bounce back and forth. Almost every time they're like, well, look, I want long-term results. And then I tell them here, you know, here's the thing, like you're going to have to, part of this is you're going to have to trust me. And trust me, and once you see what happens, and probably I'm never gonna have to ask you to trust me again at that point, then you will trust me. But right now, what I'm saying, you know, I know a lot of what I'm saying may be counter to what you think, um, but you've done it the other way. Let's try it this way. I mean, it's really, it's really a, an educational conversation that you have to have because it's difficult. It's mm-hmm. difficult when people come in with these expectations from all this, you know, poor information that it they've goes been, against the grain, you know, from what. Uh, society and what you know marketing has provided like as far as the education of the process of losing weight it is and really if you boil it really boils down to this too and if you're somebody listening that's really into longevity um because i know we're talking about weight loss but let's also talk about longevity for a second you're better off you're better off on all measures by allowing your body 
to become efficient with calories while trying to build muscle and while exercising. I know we're, we talk a lot about speeding up the metabolism, and I think that's important uh, for the average person because the average person, most people are just going to consume more. Most people are going to eat more food because they're surrounded by it. And so it's better to have a faster metabolism than to have a slower metabolism. But if you're already pretty disciplined, and that's not an issue for you, and you're already healthy and fit, and this is like your lifestyle, and you want more longevity, you're better off eating, for the most part, uh, of course, if you're getting all your essential nutrients and essential proteins and fats, you're better off doing going around it with less food than you are with more food. That's the other thing we want to consider, and there's lots of science to support that as well. And I want to say that because... There's, there are people who I've talked to who are super, super into fitness and health and who are very consistent with everything, so they have no problem with the nutrition and exercise, who think that their goal is to keep trying to boost their metabolism when, in fact, it might be the opposite. It might be like, hey, let your body become efficient because it's probably better for you in the long term to not have to eat you know, three, three 4,000 calories just to maintain your body weight. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And you'd be surprised... I, I kind of eat this way, and uh, I don't eat that much a lot of the times. And I'm, uh, it's kind of cool that I can work out as hard as I do and, and do what I do without eating as much as I used to do. You know, used to have to eat before. Yeah. So just just one of those things to consider. Well, and I think too, like a lot of people have a specific like weight loss goal in mind, or they have like a number in their head, and um, it becomes it becomes a mental discipline sort of challenge thing where they can just overcome, you know, uh, they can press their way through all these obstacles and just push their way to the end. And it's this, it's this timeline that's become established within their head of like, okay, you know, this day I'm really doing good. And you know, the next day I'm doing good. And then you start kind of losing momentum. Then you ramp back up and it's all about like ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. And then you get to the end and you did lose the weight. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I, okay, now what? Like you, you didn't, you didn't create a lifestyle that you're ever going to be able to sustain. Like you, you hated the process. You hated yourself. You hated that you were off the wagon and you had like this shitty food on these days. And you've been punishing and punishing and punishing yourself to get to this goal. Uh, now what? You know now what does it look like going forward? Mm-hmm. That's I like you have to like look past that goal, dude. I have seen, and I know you guys. Obviously, you guys worked in gyms a long time too. I have seen so many people, you know, when you manage gyms, you, it's great if you're, if you're really into observing what happens to the body with different forms of exercise, uh, and you know, attitude and all that stuff, manage a gym or work in a gym because you're in there for, you know, I was in there for 12 hours, maybe usually more almost every single day. And you see the same people coming in and I would have members that were super consistent. I mean, like for years, like I'd managed a gym for three years and I would see this, these members who came in four days a week, same time, you know, never missed a week, never missed their workout. And they'd come in and they would do it, very intense cardio. You know, they, women and men who come in would get on the elliptical or the Stairmaster or the rower and they'd fucking pedal or row or step away for, I mean, hard for an hour. You know, four days away, they go real hard. And these people were all uh, overweight. They were all either flabby, so they had excess body fat, or uh, some of them were actually 20 to 30 pounds overweight. There was one guy that used to do it, and he'd come in and he would get on the row machine. No, you know how many calories you burn, or, or how I should say strenuous uh, uh, the row machine is? One of the most strenuous forms of cardio. This fucking dude would come in. And he was, like I said, about 30 pounds or away, and he would row away for about an hour, so incredible stamina and endurance, and was about 30 pounds overweight. And so I remember when I'd see this guy, I was used to think to myself, like, he must How eat- How is he not changing? Well, I used yeah. to think, he must eat horribly, mm. or he must be super sedentary all day long. Like, he must do nothing all day long, and he must eat just a ton of food, because it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, then I got to know the guy. He was actually a mail carrier. And if you're a mailman, you probably you some great calves. You probably walk fifteen to twenty thousand steps a day. So minimum. Right away. Minimum that. Right away, way more active than the average person. Mm-hmm. So he's not just doing that hour of rowing, he's also walking all the time. So it must have been his diet. Then I talked to this guy and wow, he had an amazing knowledge of nutrition and he's eating all this food and this and that. And and I remember thinking, like, he must be lying. Well, looking back now, I realize what happened. 
is his body became so efficient at what he's doing, he probably was burning as many calories as a sedentary person. Yeah. You know what I mean? And this whatever is, he was eating, he was just storing. These Ooh. are the hardest people to help. Oh, yeah. I had a guy just like this, only he was a soccer referee. Dude was doing thirty to 50,000 steps a day, and he was a good 30 to 40 pounds overweight. Man. And talk about a fucking challenge to help this dude lose weight. Yeah, what do you do now? You can't just throttle down on more <laughs> You have activities. to completely reset these people. Yeah. You have to completely reset. And it's the hardest thing in the world is to get them to back off all the activity they're used to. And then, so they're doing all that activity. Then they come to the gym and they think they got to ramp it up even more. Mm -hmm. And then they hammer the shit out of themselves inside the gym. Meanwhile, they can't drop these 30 pounds because they've become they've trained their body to become so efficient at utilizing it's very them. tough i've had clients come to me they're the hardest i've had female yeah. clients come to me who are working out every single you know six days a week they're working out hard they're mad they're tracking their their steps and they're eating like 1500 calories a day and you know they're like you know i still have like like 15 pounds uh, i'm trying to lose and by the way these are these aren't people who are crazy and lean already like you know honestly does have 15 pounds to lose and they tell me, okay, what else should I do? Like, and it's like, what else can you? There's nothing else you can do. And so I tell them, stop what you're doing and just lift weights three days a week. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing too, by the way, if you're in this category and you do 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 and you do do that, you do stop the cardio. You do a lot of do do's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you stop the cardio and do, you do, go do, 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 do. focus on strength training. Expect a little bit of a rebound, but you got to be okay with that. Like yeah. at first, your body will probably gain some body fat. Um, but then it's going to readapt, and then you're going to start speeding up the metabolism, um, and then it's going so to change would, again. So what I would, what I do with someone like this is exactly what you said: is I, I cut out all this crazy intensity. I assess what way they're training. Now, most of the time, these are the maniac people that are CrossFit type of training, or you know, super setting, tri setting, mm -hmm. cluster setting, everything. Power yoga. Yeah, or or they're doing like jump rope in between sets because they're already this is the this is how they they think that they have to get in shape. Active rest. Active rest. So these people are perfect for okay, we're gonna cut out all this cardio. We're gonna cut out all this crazy high intensity stuff. I'm gonna switch you to like phase one of Maps Red. So you're lifting three days a week. We're heavily strength based. Now like Sal said you got to be okay with you're probably going to gain a little bit of weight. But here's the, the beauty is when we go from somebody who's been like high reps, high volume, circuit training type of training and lots of cardio to strength training like that, they're going to pack some muscle on, mm -hmm. which what we were just talking about earlier is for every pound of muscle you add, you're going to add, you know, 30 to 60 calories more a day. Your body's going to burn. Depends on the person, of course. So if that's true, then if this person even gained, let's say they gained 10 pounds, which they're probably going to freak out if they hire a trainer and he does this, <laughs> which is, but this is why, this is why it was mandatory that you I, ha I had you for at least three months was because I needed you locked in with me so I could show you this process. Because if you can trust the process, you'll see it, it works. What will happen is, okay, there'll be this initial weight gain, which if we did our job of changing your programming up, so the body now has a new adaptation, more than likely it's probably going to be heavy weight training strength-based because you're doing the opposite of what you're used to. So now the body responds. It adds some weight on the scale, but a good percentage of that weight more than likely is going to be muscle. And then that muscle ends up speeding your metabolism up or like making your, 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 your caloric maintenance higher because you now have more muscle. And we kind of go on this, okay, we're going to build for a while. I don't want you to stress about the scale. If we go up 5 or 10 pounds, don't worry about that. We're building right now. And then when you go to reverse and go back the other way, now you got their metabolism sped up a bit and they can drop weight a lot easier. And depending on how long that person has been hammering themselves will depend on how long we got to spend on kind of built re uh, rebuilding and resetting the, all this crazy amount of work they've been mm -hmm. doing. This is one of the, you know, what we're talking about is one of the reasons why, and I, we hate, of course, we, we always say like fasting is not a weight loss tool, right? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a health tool. However, I can see why uh, so many people um, like fasting. And of course, you have to have a health, by the way, you have to have a good relationship with food yeah. to, be able to, to be able to utilize it this way because I could easily see it go in the opposite direction where somebody uh, all of a sudden starts starving They'll themselves. They'll abuse it. Yeah. yeah. But I could see why because 
we just don't need as much food as we think. You know? We don't. Yeah. We really don't no. need nearly as much food as we think. And so when people stop eating one of them, like breakfast or lunch or either, and they just eat dinner, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm, well, yeah, you're not eating, you're not eating nearly as much food and, and your body doesn't meet, need nearly as much nutrition uh, or calories, I should say, as you think it does, you know? So um, it really kind of boils down to, and we've talked about this before, really just focusing on your health. It's so much more of an effective <laughs> mm-hmm. way of getting there than focusing on calorie burn. Yeah, but let's talk about some tangible intake. things to help people get that way. So for example, I literally, this is a perfect topic right now because yesterday my sister-in-law, she's battling with this. She, uh, um, she just had rotator cuff surgery. And she's she's in the worst shape of her life right now. She already kind of carries herself a little overweight as it is, and now she's like really overweight. So this is the worst she's ever been. Mm. Um, she's probably got a good 30, 30 to 40 pounds extra weight on her. And she's got shoulder issues that she's dealing with. Um, she's pretty sedentary. She doesn't really she she thinks, you know, what why I was having this conversation with her, she just got done having a salad and fish, you know. For dinner, so in her eyes, she eats pretty well, mm-hmm. and you know, she was asking me these generic questions, like you know, wh- where do I start? What do I do to start losing this weight and start dropping this right away? And my advice, and th- and this is why, you know, I'm such a fan of tracking, is this: is we talk about on the show all the time of, you know, levels of awareness. And most people are not aware of what they're really consuming, and. So, mm-hmm. and they they look at their weight loss goal. I mean, that you you could there isn't a statement that's I can't think of anything that's more true than that. It's right. so true, right? Yeah. And so when I when I look at someone like her, I said, don't look at your thirty pound weight loss goal right now. That's not the goal. That's your big goal. Yeah. But let's set small goals, right? Small weekly type achievable goals. That are gonna that are gonna set you in the right direction for that ultimate goal of lo- losing thirty pounds. I said, for example, you've never tracked before, so I said you got someone like me who literally is right around the corner from you, and I can help you out. But I can't really help you if I don't know what the fuck you're really doing, and if you're not tracking, I can't see that. So your real goal right now is let's just pay attention to how much you move and what you're consuming. That's it. Nothing else. Don't add in a crazy routine. Don't go buy some expensive program. Don't start following Sean T's whatever. Like you don't need to be just doing. Just become aware. Well, no, what are you doing? Yeah. yeah, just become aware. Be, and and it's amazing just being aware and looking at what you're consuming and how little or not you're moving every single day. How how well that already starts to help. Just mm-hmm. like oh wow. I actually thought I was getting enough of this or, oh, I actually thought I wasn't, you know, I was eating too much of this or, oh, wow, I really thought I was moving more than what I was. So there's your your first bit. So I told her, like, give a week, just one week, pay attention to everything that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Then from there, let's pick one thing that you can improve upon. And then if I can actually see it, I can give you something. And I'll give you, I said, here's some examples of what most people, what I notice right away when they track for a week is, they're, they move very little. They uh, underconsume. Uh, for women, it's very common for me that they underconsume protein. Uh, they over uh, overconsume sugar. They don't get enough fiber, and they don't rotate. Uh, they don't have a lot of rotation of food. They tend to eat this. They you know migrate to the same things. And then most adults are drinking alcohol in there. So. And instead of going like, ah, get rid of all of it, oh, fix all of it all at once, let's just address one of those issues. Mm-hmm. Just Let's just focus on I the- I think f- there's two things with that, right? It, it, as far as like the pain and shoulder and, and injury and, you know, rehabilitation and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's, it's crucial because uh, addressing the pain and, and really- improving on, you know, the movement uh, of the shoulder joint and focusing on, you know, regaining ability and doing that at a very gradual process because the pain, it's one of those things where you, you notice this, the spiral effect of pain, right? So mm-hmm. it, it, it makes it so you're not motivated to move. And then you also want to comfort yourself. Right. So these are two like big contributors to uh, gaining weight. Right. And, and people like just breeze past that whole thing like, oh, well, I need to lose weight and then I'll feel better. But no, 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 no. 
let's like alleviate pain and let's move better and that will open up well and this the is next door. what i told her for her training right because yeah. she she follows up with oh what one of your programs should i follow i said listen what you need to do is this i'm going to send you over prime and i want you we're going to work on getting your shoulder healthy and guess what you're going to be creating movement while you're doing that. So mm-hmm. you're going to get some sort of exercise. Exercise that you weren't fucking doing last week. Yeah. So already from you being aware of what you're doing and starting to make habits of correcting the the issues that you have with your shoulder, we're we're stepping in the right direction. We don't need to do any more than that. And then that's that's your first week. Then after that week, we can, again, sit down. Mm-hmm. I can look at, okay, looks like four days this last week. You did good of so, like so much of your shoulder rehab for 15 to 20 minutes of pool work or whatever it is I have her doing. And it looks like you started to improve your fiber. Okay, now let's talk about your sugar intake that's out of control. You know, let's and it's so out of control that I can't even get you all the way down where I'd like you to be right now. So let's just reduce it, reduce it by 25 grams yeah. every day. People, people don't know what number one, what's in their food uh, from a macro level. They don't know what they definitely don't know what's in their food from a micro level. Oh yeah. Um, and people don't eat food based on those things almost ever. The way that people choose food is based on what I feel like eating, mm-hmm. what tastes good. Um, and of course, and the perception of healthy too. And, well, and is, and and how we're brainwashed that there's yeah. certain foods you eat in the morning, certain foods you eat for lunch, right. and certain foods that you eat for dinner. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, where he was saying how, oh yeah, when I was a kid, you know, because he grew up overweight and then eventually like had to learn how to how to navigate that and then became fit and healthy. And he's like, yeah, my, for dinner, my mom would routinely give us like chili cheese fries or. You know, a, a you know a frozen pizza, or and his mom, who I know is a wonderful woman. She's a loving person. She's not a bad person at all. She she just didn't even consider it. Like she didn't even think about it because yeah. we're never taught uh, or to to think that you know what you put in your mouth is really that important. And I know I know this for a fact. I know most people, most parents, for example, if they knew what they were giving their kids. Like if I knew every time I gave my kid this food uh, and I'm doing it over time and every morning they have a Pop-Tart or it's, whatever, it's that I'm increasing their risk. chronic disease. Yeah, I'm increasing yeah. that their risk of diabetes by 30% or the risk of cancer by 15% or the risk of autoimmune disease by, and oh I'm, I'm making God. up numbers. Nobody up. wants to think about that. Nobody would actually do it. Like, would you give your kid a cigarette in the morning? Well, of course not. Would you give them a bottle of Windex and tell them to take a shot of that? every? Well, of course not because you know those things are bad for you, but we don't consider... Uh, how important food is. It's the most, it's one of the most important things. Uh, actually, if not the most important thing, that impacts, it literally makes up our body. It, it's yeah, every, it's, it's, it's everything. Ourselves. Well, yeah. and what blows me away even more is when you go to the doctor and, and like I said, I lived through this. I had a family member with cancer and I sat there with the freaking oncologist and I, he hated me because of the questions I was asking him. I was breaking his balls every time I was there. And I asked him, I said, what kind of food should she eat? You know, because she had to go undergo like this extensive chemo. And he's like, well, it really doesn't matter. You know, just eat, you know, whatever feels good for you. And then, you know, we'll, we'll, and, I'm, and I remember thinking like, like what? what the fuck are you talking? Just be honest and say you don't know. Yeah. Because how can the food not matter? Right. How can the food not matter when we're fighting a chronic disease? Food always matters. Man. It always yeah. matters. You go to a dermatologist, you know, I, I, I had a cousin who went to the dermatologist because she had severe acne. And I told her before she went to the doctor, we need to look at your food and your gut health because that is, uh, that's a huge contributor to your skin issues. She goes to the fucking dermatologist and comes back and tells me, no, you're totally wrong. I brought those things up and the dermatologist said it has nothing to do with my acne. How in the fuck can what you put yeah, in your mouth every single day logically. have zero effect, according to this doctor, to your, to your skin? How is that even possible? So- when you were saying, Adam, you know, just being aware, you're totally right. People have zero consideration because they just think that it doesn't matter. We're taught that well, it doesn't matter. We're taught it, to. And those just, are all the authority figures that we all like. Well, the doctor told me that. That's it. And and when we are obese, we're told it's because we're fucking lazy. Mm-hmm. You're lazy, and that's and you have poor self control. Well, I think it's because we're eating the wrong types of foods. And when we do exercise, we're doing what you're telling us, which is. 30 minutes of vigorous activity every single day and I notice I get no results from it. Of course, I'm not going to have 
any uh, you know any motivation to, well, to this exercise. Is, I, I find so many. You you made a great point about missing like or people having no, very few people know what macronutrients in food. Most people have no clue yeah, what micronutrients. Very little. And you know this was the the analogy I gave to her was this. So the body has eleven different systems that are responsible for efficiently running. And when you look at the body, think of it like a car. And you've got your tires, you've got your timing belt, you've got the fuel, you've got the motor, you've got the steering, you have the steering wheel, you have the carburetor, right? We we can sit here and I can list off 11 parts, 11 parts, yeah, that doesn't make it (laughs) run. You could run without that. I tried to contribute there. But you got 11 (laughs) 11 major parts to this this vehicle that are responsible for making it run efficiently. Now, you take out, if you have flat tires, you could still drive a car forward. If you don't have all the oil in the car, you could still get it going. How long it lasts, I don't know, but it's it could still go, right? But it's not going to run very efficiently. The body is the same way too. We all just seem to think that like food is fuel. As long as I get it, I can go, I can do this. But when you're not fueling all these systems with the things that are uh, it needs, then those systems start to not operate correctly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when and they all speak to each other. It's like we never we never talk about the endocrine system. We never talk about these other systems of the body that are are, are part of what make up the metabolism, dude, your digestive system. Dude, like right. how can we not talk about di- our hormones, digestive yeah. I- enzymes? That's another one that people miss all the time. And it's like if that if how you digest food and process food if you don't think that has to do with your metabolism and how your body burns and uses fuel, you're silly. Dude, then you throw in the microbiome, hormones, neurotransmitters, you know, parasympathetic, sympathetic system, like all the, I mean, I could, I could rattle off, off a list of things that we know about, and I say that with uh, emphasis because right. we only know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. So even all the stuff that we know about, the complexity by which – they operate the body and communicate with each other, and the, the complexity by which the food that we eat or the things that we eat, the things that we breathe, how they affect those systems and how those systems affect other systems, we have no fucking idea. And this is the number one reason why I will always, oh, and until we get to the point where we have artificial intelligence that's so fucking advanced that it literally understands everything, and that's going to take a while, until we get to that point, I will always advocate against eating foods that contain synthetic chemicals and additives because we may study these things according to what we know, but we have no idea how they affect the things that we don't know. We have no idea. And then later on, we discover a new system or this new thing that's, you know, that works in the body. And then we're like, oh, uh, by the way, that thing that we said that was safe, you know, that red dye number 40 or whatever. You're wrong. It, It turns out it affects the system that we just discovered. And it affects it in a bad way, but we didn't know before, and that's why well, we said again, it was safe. Well, again, going back to the car analogy, it's like this. It's like we all are very aware. If we build an engine that's either runs on, on gasoline or diesel or whatever fuel, right? So the engine is built specifically for that. But if you took gasoline and you threw some dirt in there or if you, like, put half water in there, you could probably still get the car to start and run, and therefore you get these, and the body, very similar, like we get... We, Except the body's about a trillion times more... More complex, complex. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Like a trillion times, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give you well, an example. Well, it's all those checks and balances that will overcome that process, which will make one, you know, more efficient, that will kind of like help the body to keep maintaining it, the system well, normalcy. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's talk about a very common, like one I've talked about many times, glyphosates, right? Glyphosates are herbicides that were invented to be uh, sprayed on plants to kill them, and they were invented alongside genetically modified plants that could withstand them. So uh, what happens is I can grow corn that's designed in a laboratory, by the way. And by the way, the way they do this is they'll take genes from a bacteria or from something else and create this, this scientific experiment that they'll call corn. And I can spray the fuck out of it with glyphosate. It won't die, but all the plants around it will die. So now I've got this really effective way of farming, right? But you're also consuming now these glyphosate residues. Now, if I, if I looked at my body systems that, you know, all the systems that we understood, hormones and, you know, all the stuff that we understood to study when glyphosate's first hit the market, we could see that, oh, well, the way glyphosates are designed, they have no interaction with these systems. It should come right out the body. So it's perfectly healthy. 
Well, now we're seeing some crazy shit. Now we're understanding that glyphosates, first of all, are, are an antibiotic. So they have antibiotic properties. Well, what happens when you consume something that affects your microbiome over long periods of time? Mm. A lot of bad shit mm -hmm. now we're starting to discover. Here's another thing we're starting to learn. We're starting to learn that glyphosates actually damage the proteins that, that maintain the junctions between the cells that maintain your gut uh, wall. This, this wall that is intelligently permeable. In other words, it allows certain things to come in and it doesn't allow certain things to come in. And it does so, and it's very complex, and it does so in a way where it gives you what you need and what you don't need. But if you damage the junctions between the cells, and this, by the way, this wall is one cell thick. Mm -hmm. So it is very, very thin. It's very, very uh, fragile. And when you damage these junctions, now you're allowing other things to creep into the system. And what's behind this single cell wall of your gut? 80% of your immune system. So now you're creating immune responses in the body because things are going through that are not supposed to, and you're creating food intolerances, intolerances to you're creating normal things, autoimmune right? issues, yeah. you're damaging your the, the cell's ability to communicate with each other, and they've just discovered that bacteria communicate with human cells as well. And in fact, there are certain compounds that you can... Uh, that you can ingest and uh, which come from the soil, which by the way, our soil is so damaged and depleted now, but there's certain compounds in there that allow bacteria to, to communicate with your with your human cells so that the bacteria can actually help your body protect itself. I mean, it's literally, mm. it's such a symbiotic relationship. It's crazy. But glyphosates cause these problems. Glyphosates are also heavily sprayed on wheat. Mm -hmm. Gliadin, which is uh, something that's found in wheat, or like gluten, can also damage uh, the, 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 the junctions, but when you combine it with glyphosate, it causes big problems. So what we thought was maybe gluten intolerance is wow. really glyphosate issues with gluten. Could be, yeah, that versus not even just the gluten, it's mainly the, the glyphosate. Well, so. here's some- Or in combination of both. Here's some anecdote. Yes, combination of both is most likely, but mostly from the glyphosate. And here's something interesting, and this is anecdote um, that I've heard now I don't know, over a dozen times, which led me to go online and read uh, people on forums, on health forums, and this is a big, very common thing, and I experienced it myself, where people who are who think they're gluten intolerant, who have an, uh, a reaction to gluten in America, will go to Europe and will eat pasta and bread and will have no reaction. Fine. They'll have no reaction. I've heard that actually just anecdotally from some of my clients when they're in like Italy and they're going through and they had like a heavy pasta Die, like, and they can't handle it over here. That's, That's right. And one, no glyphosates with it? Well, I don't understand. So what. glyphosates are heavily regulated in Europe. And if something is they're labeled, well, that's right, because right? it's labeled exactly. It's and labeled and in the mar so the market never really adopted the shenanigans it. here where we just breeze past that. Like, oh my god, I can't believe that. Oh, law if didn't you pass. if you look at the way it's glyphosates crazy became uh, as educated as we think we are. If like, you look at the like way they, happens. it's funny. Like who who would vote against that? Like why would you not want to be informed? Just yeah, just let us know. Okay. Rather than, not saying you can't well, have it. It's like corporate why, interest. To make a long story short, um, and you if people listeners, you can look this up so you can see all the details make a long story short the way they were passed as being um you know uh fine for consumption is kind of shady but really the shady part was how glyphosates uh were able to uh, excuse me how uh gmos were able to not be uh labeled yeah that's what boggles me yeah, yeah so if i have a gmo corn then the organic cor corn farmers would tell me, "Hey, look, you shouldn't be able to call that corn because yeah, that's a patent. Corn. It's a patented product, right? Because it's created. You've, you've, you actually have patented it, like 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 if I designed, uh, you know, something else in a laboratory, it's patented. Yeah. But what they did is they took it to the to the all the way up the I, don't, I think all the way up to the Supreme Court, and um, they said no, they can call it corn. So then the consumer, the American consumer, had no idea. So it just took over the market because we were just buying the cheaper product because it was made with, with GMO food, you know, GMO foods. When we know for a fact, if the label said on it, GMO, the average American consumer would be like, Ooh, I'm not going to have that. And, yeah. it would, and that's what happened in Europe. In Europe, they do have GMOs, but they have to label them GMOs and they have a small market share because people won't buy them. Yeah. The other thing too, is it's, I don't think it's legal over there to use glyphosates to finish their wheat. Whereas here we don't have GMO wheat uh, but what we do is we spray the wheat with with glyphosates to kill it to kind of dry it out and get it ready for 
uh, for harvesting. So even though you're eating wheat that's maybe not GMO, it's still completely covered in, in glyphosate. Here's the fucking great part, by the way, with glyphosate. I know I'm going off on a tangent, but this is an interesting subject. I've been doing a lot of research. You know, when Ben came over to my house, we talked a lot about yeah. this, and I've been doing a lot of research on this. Glyphosates are water soluble. So that means that they get into the soil, uh, they evaporate with the water, and they come down like rain, which is why even organic foods many times will have glyphosate residues. Damn it. Your water will have glyphosate residues. Uh, they find glyphosate uh, glyphosates in breast milk and in urine of most pregnant women, most people. So you can try to limit your exposure, but you're gonna you're definitely the environment is super saturated. You're definitely being exposed, and yeah. I'm currently researching ways to just protect your body because it's pretty much unavoidable. Unavoidable. It's everywhere. Like there's almost nothing you could do to completely avoid it. Just eat organic, non-GMO foods. And, oh, you'll, and you'll reduce your or, load. Yeah, eat, I mean, what about big reduction. you have farmers markets and you're, you're shopping from there? You got to be able to get it from that. You'll reduce your you'll reduce the if, the. But here's the thing: like, if it rains and there's glyphosate residue in the rain, and it rains on your organic crop, you're still going to get some residue. You, It'll be less. What do you mean? How how is there how is there residue in the rain? Because they're water soluble. So glyphosates are water soluble. So okay. when they water when they spray the fuck out of their GMO plants, yeah. That goes into the water. The water evaporates. Mm-hmm. Then it, it rains. Stays in the water. And then it rains. Oh around. shit! And you're still getting it from the rain. They're finding it in well water. So people's mm-hmm. well water, they'll test it for glyphosate. I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Doug, maybe you could check this out. Doctor Mercola, I believe, has a glyphosate test kit that you can buy, and you can test your own urine. Of course, to Mercola. see, yeah, to see <laughs> how much uh, how much glyphosate. Anyway, uh, long story short. Um, you know, this is just one of the things that's impacting our health, and it has to do with what we consume. So, uh, well, just cause the combination of what you're saying right now, too, I, you know, it just reminds me of, you know, I remember we got into the whole thing with the doctor who did the whole recommendation of the protein shake. And I think, you know, the title of what we're talking about right now is like the worst way to lose weight. Right. And, you know, it, I think it's pretty common that you see this where people will you know, overtrain right out the gates. They start to, you know, blast their body in the weight room, blast their body on cardio, and then they start eating bars and shakes in replace of meals to reduce calories. And that has to be the worst thing you could do for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Can start, you start, you up, take your, you know, fake, you know, fake processed food intake in addition to pressing the fuck out of your body just so it gets so you it. can adapt downward yeah so you can slow your metabolism i down. mean i don't know if you could potentially do something no. worse I, to start off now i like your approach to nutrition which i think we need to push a little more on the show because i think it's it's from a psychological standpoint it's brilliant because mo- the way people eat when they try to diet is typically eliminate yeah like don't eat yeah. these things yeah but restrict, restrict. I like I like what you said, Adam, and and it's that's the way I've taught my clients in the past. I never really put it in words, but I would always tell them, eat these, aim for these foods, and then if you're still hungry or whatever, eat whatever you want. And mm-hmm. what usually would happen is that they would end up eating healthy and eating less of the other stuff, just naturally. Mm-hmm. And it's also psychologically, it's not the mentality where I can't. Right. It's more like just make sure you. You're eat. eliminating a lot of the punishment you know, mentality with it. It's more of like, I'm seeking and I'm, and I'm actively trying to gather these foods. Yeah. Yeah. So like, think to yourself, like, okay, I'm going to actively eat these fats that I know that are healthy. I'm going to actively today eat this many vegetables Mm -hmm. because I'm looking for these nutrients and this is the variety I'm looking for. I'm going to uh, actively eat these forms of protein today because I know I need them. And then if I'm still hungry or whatever, then then that's fine. But those are the things that I eat first, mm-hmm. and those are the things that I chase after. And I like that approach a lot because what I've experienced with that is you usually don't want to afterwards, well, right? Well, it, it, it kind of flips the whole diet mentality mentality on its head, right? And, you know, and it's just we we know this. Like if you tell somebody – Tell a child, you tell a grown adult, they can't have it, and naturally, you want to have it. Naturally, you want to do it because you're you've been told you're not supposed to. And this is why IIFYM had so much success because it was like, oh, you could have whatever you want as long as it fits your macros. Well, the missing piece to that is this is just like I said earlier that 
the body has so many systems and there's so many nutrients out there that are responsible. I mean, when I look at the, I didn't even finish going all the you know, steps with this, you know, client or my sister-in-law that I would uh, tell her to go after. But, you know, you see people who don't get out and get enough sun. So you see the lack of vitamin D, you see people not getting enough vitamin C, you see people not getting enough iron. You see, there's a lot of these things that are found in food that they don't get enough of. And by going after foods and then kind of looking out like what I'm doing right now is I'm, you know, documenting everything that I consume. And then I'm kind of taking a bird's eye view of like, okay, all right, good. It looks like I have a nice, I'm getting some vitamin D, got my shrooms in here. I'm doing that. Okay. Get some bell peppers, onions stuff here. So, okay, good. Getting some digestive enzymes here. Okay, cool. Getting a good diverse amount of fruit. So I'm getting my antioxidants here. Okay. So I'm looking at it like that, like, okay, these are all the things that my body wants and needs to run efficiently. And I'm trying to go after that versus, uh, can't have this cause it's going to make me fat or mm-hmm. can't do this. Cause that's, you know, instead of looking at it like that, looking at, there's a ton of things that your body needs and you would be amazed on how many of these things that people lack on a weekly basis. And then if that happens on a weekly basis, it's most certainly happening on a monthly. And this is where like going back to your point where skin issues and autoimmune and, you know, it's normally because there's a, we're way out of balance. You're way over consuming something else and you're not getting enough of this other thing that you mm-hmm. need. And if you were learning to look at your foods and go after the things you need, you'd be surprised on how easy it is to to not over consume on the bad things because you're so worried about getting the things that your body needs yeah, for and nourishment. It, and if you view your, I mean, if you look at your body in this way, like most people uh, in modern societies, uh, even today, right? Most people don't die of old age. They just don't. The average death is caused by some type of disease. If we even if we eliminate accidents and all that stuff, there's some kind of disease that ends up happening that kills us, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, or autoimmune or cancer. And the body is extremely effective at uh, not getting cancer. It's extremely effective at not getting heart disease, not getting diabetes. It's actually the most effective thing you have at fighting off anything. It's very, very good. In fact, uh, you are exposed to you know, pathogens every single day. And the reason why you don't get sick every single day is your body uh, does a good job of fighting those things off. It's why if you get certain diseases, like, uh, you know, you have, if you have an, uh, uh, an immune uh, type disease that destroys your immune system, a simple common cold can kill you. You know, something that you would normally fight off or not even get. Like the body's very, very effective. And if we just uh, balance the body out and feed it the way it should be fed and keep it uh, healthy, it will do a better job of keeping you healthy and fighting off things like cancer uh-huh. and degenerative disease better than anything that you yeah. can possibly think of to the point where you'll be disease free until you just die of old age. So it's really if you get something, if you get some kind of a disease, and I hate the whole genetic you know, argument. And yes, genes play a role, but I hate the, um, oh, it was genetic. There's nothing they could have done. Yeah. It was just some kind of a genetic. You know, that's actually pretty rare. It's actually pretty rare that you have that much of a that there's there's a clear genetic issue that is not influenced at all by lifestyle, wh- whether it be epigenetics or whatever, to where uh, no matter what you do, you're going to get something. Mm-hmm. It's pretty, it's very very rare. What you what probably happened was a combination of genetics and lifestyle. So you gave your body whatever blueprint you had, the right freaking the wrong excuse me lifestyle that made your genes you know, produce, uh, not fight those, those cells that were became cancerous, for example. So it really goes down to, it goes down to all of that. So oh, yeah. I, that, I, that's why I think for me, one of the things I'm most fascinated in epigenetics and what's going the research that's going into that, because that to me is, I, I hate hearing people say, I'll never forget when my buddies, uh, first said that when they were starting to creep into their thirties and it was like, Oh, I'm, I'm destined to get this. I'm destined to be this way. So fuck it, you know, and I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? Like, why, yeah. why would you do that? And I, you said it really well on the podcast a long time ago, and I, and I think it's such a great point. It's like it, none of that even matters anyways, because you don't do all these things. You don't nourish your body with the foods and easy. We don't ex- strength train and exercise because we're going to try and add five years to our life. It's even though that was probably what's going to happen as a byproduct. 
you're doing it to improve your current life right now. You're you're trying you're not trying to add years to your life. You're trying to add life to your years. Right. And this and this is from living a particular way. And you know, we're talking about weight loss right now and really if you approach your nutrition, if you start your nutrition goals with that, with saying, okay, here's the things that are healthy. These are the things I'm going to try and just eat. Uh, like I'm going to eat vegetables, you know, twice a day. I'm going to eat one piece of fruit every single day. I'm going to drink enough water every single day. I'm going to have uh, healthy fats every single day. If you just start with that approach, you're going to be uh, better off in the long run than someone who just comes out with the whole restrictive approach. And if you approach your exercise with resistance training being the cornerstone of it, you're going to set yourself up for long-term success. This is why I wish, and I, I know in the future this is what's going to happen, and I called it, It's good. I don't know how long it's going to take, but it will happen eventually, where the recommendation for exercise will no longer be 30 minutes of brisk walking or whatever. The, act, the, the recommendation for everyone is going to be go lift weights, go do resistance training, because they're going to, they're, it's, I mean, the science is very clear. Like The only thing that's going to give you that metabolic advantage uh, in the long term is resistance training. And of course, uh, no form of exercise is anti-aging like resistance training. Nothing comes close to well, it. Well, I'm going to tell our audience the same thing that I told my sister-in-law yesterday, which was, and it was funny because I'll tell you what her, before I tell you, I'll tell you her response to me, which is, well, you're, you're already fit. It's so different because you're so, you're <laughs> fit already. And I, and I looked at her and I said, it, actually, what you don't realize is it's more challenging. If we both are to lose 10% body fat, it is it is more challenging for me to reduce ten percent than it is for you to reduce ten percent. So our journey actually can be very similar. And so to the audience, if you're getting ready to you know get in great shape for the summer and you're extra motivated right now and you're wanting to know which direction should I go or how should I start, we created a a summer starter kit for for somebody just like you where it's our foundational program our maps red program it comes with prime so it comes with a compass so if you got any imbalances aches pains things going on it shows you how to do a a test at home where it'll show you how to address all those imbalances and incorporate that within your your strength training routine and then our nutrition and fasting guide bundle that teaches you how to fast properly teaches you how to eat with color and balance and then on top of that, you also get the forum access completely for free where you've got access to all three of us where we can help guide you through your process along with all kinds of other brilliant minds and professionals that are inside there to help guide you, check form, whatever you need. And then on top of that, I just started my journey last week again where I'm going to transform myself into getting shredded again like as if I was competing. So I've got a ways to go myself. And so you can watch how I slowly make changes nutritionally and ramp up volume and follow that on my Insta story. So check that out. You can go to mindpumpmedia.com and you can get that right now. Excellent. 30 Days of Coaching is also available and that's for free. And basically it's a cash of information um, that we've accumulated over the last two and a half years of recording podcasts, but we've just categorized it so that the topics are easy to to get to and learn from. Uh, all you got to do is go to our site, the one that Adam just said, mindpumpmedia.com, and opt in. Also, um, our Instagram pages, we cover lots of topics that you may not hear about on the podcast. Now, the the podcast has a, has a, has a page, it's Mind Pump Media, but then we have our own personal pages. Mine is Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam, and Justin is Mind Pump Justin. And lastly, if you want to learn uh, you know, more exercises or new movements for correctional purposes or performance purposes or even aesthetic purposes, we have a YouTube channel, and we post a new video every single day, and it's called Mind Pump TV or MPTV. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. 
If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support. And until next time, this is Mind Pump.